Thanks so much, uh, everyone, for taking out time uh, out of uh, work day uh, to uh, hear about my new book, Choosing College. Um, I got to speak at the Google Book Talk about five years ago when my book, Blended, uh, came out. And it's interesting because that book was really focused on K-12 education, and this one is obviously on higher ed uh, and adult learning. And what's so, uh, I, I, a lot of people have asked sort of why switch from K-12 schools uh, to focusing on colleges and universities and adult learners. And from my perspective, I guess, ultimately, every day I wake up thinking about how can we build a better system that allows all students to fulfill their uh, potential and realize and build their passions. And ultimately, they're getting touched by all these different touch points with, uh, throughout the system. And so it's really the same question. It's just a different uh, part of your age and stage. What's also interesting about this particular talk, I think, is Google hits the question of uh, higher education in a lot of different ways. Google, of course, builds products uh, for colleges and universities. Uh, Google uh, supports learning directly uh, through a variety of partnerships and its own uh, created uh, content and certificates and so forth uh, that sometimes competes with or aids. Uh, there's a huge advertising business um, through colleges and universities, particularly in the online market in higher education. And of course, many of you come here as lifelong learners or parents of kids or expecting kids uh, uh, who, are, who are thinking about this question that's incredibly high stakes now. Uh, about where should they go to college and so forth. And the fundamental thrust of this book is that we all too often default to asking uh, what college should we go to or how should we get in. And we don't step back and take a bigger question of why are we trying to go? What's the progress we're really trying to make? What's our purpose in going? And if you answer that question first and foremost, then you can start to see a greater set of options that align to what you need uh, to make progress and make a much better choice. What I thought I would do, given all those different audiences for, for this talk, is first step back and walk through the methodology we used uh, in framing the book, which is around this jobs to be done thinking that uh, arose out of Clay Christensen's uh, research at the Harvard Business School. My thought is that uh, going through this work, which I know Google has used in certain applications and so forth, uh, is something that generalizable uh, to beyond the question of higher education and hopefully will be helpful in a variety of ways. And then we'll talk about how we actually uh, framed it into this world of higher education itself and the, uh, some of the conclusions that we, uh, that, that we arrived in. Totally happy to take questions as, as we're going through it. I know it's supposed to be sort of me talk and then questions, but if people have curiosity questions or want to dive deep on something, I'm happy to follow you all. I think it's most helpful when this is productive for, for everyone in the room and uh, everyone watching. So. Uh, we'll start with this question of, uh, assuming these clickers work. All right, I'm just going to click forward. Um, so of uh, why college? And essentially, it arose out of this larger research, as I was saying, around how do we uh, design services that delight our users. And typically, what companies will do is that they'll segment the world by product category or customer demographic. And then they'll collect tons of data about how they stack up along these various dimensions. And what we realized uh, through this jobs to be done lens or this jobs to be done theory is that the big challenge about framing the world through data about what type of customer are, are you or what product category should I be competing with or what percentage of the market do I have versus someone else is that from the perspective of the individual buyer, him or herself, the world isn't structured by these artificial categories. Instead, we find ourselves in particular contexts or situations trying to make progress. And what you ultimately have to do uh, is observe the world from the individual's perspective along that particular context they're in and what progress and success look like. So just as an example, uh, to start to make this come uh, home a little bit more, in the 1990s, uh, Milky Way and Snickers bars, both owned by M&M Mars, we're wondering, are, are these two uh, candy bars essentially competitors with each other? By producing both of these things, are we cannibalizing sales? And so my co-author, Bob Mesta, did research uh, for uh, m and Mars to ask this question of, let's take it from a different standpoint. Instead of thinking about this by the average customer demographic most likely to buy this, one of these candy bars, or thinking about this as just a category of, of uh, candy bars, Let's think about why do people hire a different one of these bars from the other one? What's the circumstance they're in? And what's the job to be done? 
And as he did the research, he realized that they're not cannibalizing each other at all. What's interesting is that Snickers are essentially bought as a meal replacement. So when you're on the run, you're trying to grab and go, you don't have time for lunch or dinner or something like that, people often would just grab a Snickers bar as something to replace that meal. And so it competed with Cliff bars today, like RX bars and things like that. And once they realized that, then they could start to change the advertising campaign around it. You, you're not you when you're hungry. Snickers really satisfies and things like that. And actually changed the recipe of the candy bar as well. They made it thicker, more nougat -y and so forth, just to really make sure that it satisfied and filled someone up when they grabbed the Snickers bar on the run. You contrast that with the Milky Way, hired for something totally different. Milky Ways were actually hired, honestly, as uh, uh, something to comfort someone. Uh, in times of distress or when they were sad or something like that. And so rather than compete with other uh, candy bars, it was much more likely to, at least in my household, uh, compete with tubs of ice cream or things like that. Uh, and so once you realized why people hired these, you realized they weren't competing each, against each other at all, but you would actually structure them extremely differently. And this insight uh, points to something that a uh, professor a long, long time ago, Theodore Levitt at Harvard uh, said, which was that people are motivated to buy not because they want a particular product, so people don't buy the quarter inch drill, as he said, but people just really want the freaking hole, as, he would, as, as I would say. Right? It's the outcome, not the product itself that they're after. But even this is frankly incomplete, because it doesn't say why they want the hole or what context they're in. Are they trying to hang something in their house? Is it for industrial use? Is it to do wiring? Because depending on the answer to that question defines what products are helpful and what isn't helpful. Right? A lot of different things can make a whole, but depending on your purpose and context defines what's a good outcome versus a bad outcome. And it points to this other question, which is uh, which one is better, pizza or uh, steak? Now, if you're a vegan, you might have a particular answer on this. If you're gluten intolerant, you might have a particular answer on this. But for the most part, it's a silly question, right? Because we hire them for two fundamentally different things in our lives. So as an example, bringing a second grade team uh, soccer party to a high-end steakhouse, really bad idea, right? Uh, bringing them to a pizza shack, perfect place for a second grade soccer party. Vice versa, taking a nice client out to a low-end pizza shack, not a great idea to impress. A high-end steakhouse really does the job well. And so that context of a situation really matters. One more story just to really illustrate this uh, that unfolded in the mid-1990s again uh, with uh, Bob, which was this fast food company wanted to understand why do people buy milkshakes? And how, more importantly, how should we improve it so that we can drive up sales and things of that nature? And so. Uh, they had categorized the world by customer demographic, and they knew the average customer most likely to buy a milkshake. And basically, they would call these people in to focus groups uh, and ask them, how should we improve the sales of milkshakes? And so they would give very clear feedback, you know, change these flavors, add these ingredients, whatever it might be. And ultimately, sales didn't budge a bit. So these, uh, and it points to something, which is that when you ask someone how to improve a product, people will almost always lie to you about whether they like something or how to improve it. And they don't lie because they're mendacious people or bad people, but frankly, they just often don't know right, what they actually want in something. It's not their job to innovate. It's your all job uh, as the company and innovators to innovate and help them understand what progress is. And so much more important than asking them how to improve something is watching what they do, not what they say. And so uh, Bob, again, my co-author on this work, what he did was uh, rather than ask people how to improve the sales of milkshakes or how to improve the product, he stood in the back of the restaurant for 18 hours a day for several days in a row for several weeks. And he took copious notes of any time someone came in and bought a milkshake. What time of day was it? What were they wearing? Were they with anyone else? Uh, did they buy the milkshake and uh, drink it as they were running off to their car? Or did they stay in the restaurant and slurp it down? On and on and on. And at the end of, the, uh, end of this period of several weeks, he saw a few interesting things from the data. 80% of milkshakes were sold at two times during the day. 50% were during the early morning rush hour commute. Kind of gross, but it is America. 30% um, <laughs> were in the late afternoon. Of the 50% group, 
Every single one of them came into the restaurant by themselves. They bought nothing but a milkshake, and every single one of them went off to their car slurping the milkshake down. Six in the morning, OK? Of the late afternoon, it was a very different situation, which we can talk about in a moment. But so after watching this behavior for week after week after week, Bob finally said, I got I to gotta talk to these people, right? And so rather than standing inside the restaurant, he finally positioned himself outside the restaurant. And as people left with the milkshake in hand, he accosted them. And not to do an intervention, but maybe he should have. Uh, but he basically said, excuse me, I just got to know. Like, why did you just buy this milkshake? What, what job are you trying to do in your life? And they sort of struggled with it and couldn't figure out what he was asking. And he said, OK, think about the last time you were in this situation doing whatever you're doing right now. What else did you buy? And they said, you know, I've got a 30-minute drive to work right now. I'm not particularly starving at the moment. But I know if I don't eat something, I'll be starving by like 7.30 or 8 or 9 o'clock or something like that. And I just want something to keep me full throughout the morning and occupy myself, frankly, while I'm driving for 30 minutes on this really boring commute that I have every single day. And so uh, come to think of it, I hired bagels last week. But take it from me, bagels don't do this job well at all. Because if you live anywhere outside of New York City, uh, they, uh, they're dry and tasteless. They, they crumb all over your suit pants. To make them taste good, you got to spread cream cheese and jam on them. And if you're driving with your knees while you're doing that and the cell phone rings, you got major problems. Uh, I hired uh, donuts once. But that was terrible because I had to lie to my wife about it. And she saw right through the lie when she got in the car later that night. Uh, because the steering wheel was totally gummy and sticky and so forth. Um, I hired bananas once to do this morning rush hour commute job. But bananas actually are the worst thing of all because uh, the stupid banana is gone in 30 seconds. I was starving by uh, 9 o'clock. And it just didn't uh, keep me uh, occupied or full uh, for my commute or in the morning. But it turns out that when I come in here and buy a milkshake, it just does the job perfectly. It's so thick and viscous, I have no idea what they put in the thing, if it's healthy or not. Frankly, I don't care, because it sinks to the bottom of my stomach and easily keeps me full throughout the morning. It's so thick and viscous, it takes forever to suck up that tiny little straw. Easily lasts me my 30-minute drive to work. And you know, God gave me two hands. I've always had one in the steering wheel, never known what to do with this hand. And it turns out there's a cup holder here, and the milkshake fits in perfectly. And so it turned out that the milkshake did the morning rush hour commute job better than its competitors, which weren't just like Wendy's uh, milkshakes or Burger King milkshakes and so forth, but it was all those plus coffee, bagels, donuts, bananas, and so forth, right? And so their share of the market was actually a lot smaller than they realized. In the late afternoon, just to give you a sense, same average demographic coming in to, uh, into the restaurant to buy a milkshake, but now they came in with their kids. And uh, they would basically buy the equivalent of a Happy Meal. And then you'd get the tug on your jacket from your child. And they'd say, Mom, Dad, can't I please have a milkshake? And basically, you felt so tired and, and sort of sad almost for having said no to so many things to your kid for the past week. This felt like an innocent enough thing that you could say yes to and feel like a good parent. And so you'd get the Happy Meal, you'd get your child a milkshake. And then you'd sit, on the, sit in the restaurant. And you'd start to drink the milkshakes. Or excuse me, you'd eat, the, you'd eat your burgers. Those would go quickly. And then your child would go in on that milkshake. And if anyone's had this experience recently, you know kids don't exactly slurp these things up quickly. Uh, so they'd start to slurp it up slowly. And first you'd sit there waiting patiently, because you hired it to feel like a good patient parent. And then you'd sit there waiting impatiently as they just struggled to get a quarter of the way through the thing. And then at some point, you just say, oh my god, we just got to get going. This is ridiculous. And you take the half-consumed milkshake, you throw it in the trash can as you dragged your kid to the car with a temper tantrum uh, ensuing. And then you call me into a focus group. And you say, well, how should we improve the sale of milkshakes? How should we improve this product? And what do I tell you? Because I hire it for two fundamentally different jobs and circumstances in my life, right? And so it points to something that Peter Drucker said a long time ago, which is that the cu customer is rarely buying what the business thinks it's selling them. As we'll see in higher education, this is certainly the case. But once you understand, and this is part of the argument that we make in the book, 
is once you understand what success looks like and what the job really is and the dimensions uh, of, of that job, you can actually design a far better experience to help students or anyone make progress. And so in the case of, uh, it, it starts with understanding what's really the job to be done. Not just the functional dimensions of it, but the emotional and social ones are really important too. Right, in, in the morning rush hour commute, the social dimensions is I need, to see, I need to be seen alone with this. Like I actually don't want anyone to see me as I'm consuming a milkshake in the morning. Whereas in the afternoon, it's all about how I relate to my kid, right? And how others perceive me as he or she is, is uh, having a temper tantrum. Um, the, uh, s once you understand that, then you can start to say what experiences in purchase and use do we really need to provide so that we can nail this job perfectly? And then finally, the last part of it is then we can say, okay, what are the actual things we need to build and how do we have to stitch them together? How do we have to integrate them to create this holistic experience that delivers on that uh, job? And so just really briefly, in the morning rush hour commute job, you'd actually make the milkshake thicker, right? Because you want to make sure that it lasts for the 30 minutes. Uh, they, the restaurant thought that they were well integrated and that they had a machine in the back that would mix all the ingredients together and a dispenser. But actually understanding the morning rush hour commute job that people want to get in, just get on their day and go, you'd realize that you'd actually pull that dispenser to the front of the line, give people a prepaid swipe card so they can just dash in, gas up, and get on their way. And then finally, you'd actually stir in tiny chunks of fruit not to make the milkshake healthier because the individuals are extremely clear. They don't care if it's healthy. I mean, they're buying a freaking milkshake. Um, but so that every once in a while they'd be slurping up the milkshake and go swallow a piece of fruit and gee, that was interesting. So it sort of keeps them awake as they drive. True story if you want to have a Panera or Jamba Juice shake after this. But uh, so ultimately understanding this job helps you understand how to build or design the experience. So just briefly targeting the job, if, if you sort of uh, categorize the world by product category, you tend to have misaligned feature creep because you're constantly saying, oh, you know, Burger King has X, Y, and Z in their milkshakes, we ought to do the same thing. Or in the case of higher ed, if Stanford adds a, a high-priced gymnasium, you better believe Harvard's going to do the same thing. Um, the, the flip side is uh, framing the world by customer category. And then you tend to get a lot of one-size-fits-none products because you're trying to be all things to all people regardless of the situation or circumstance. And then the third piece is this, if you frame it by job to be done, you can really get that proper critical uh, integration of critical experiences. So one more thing around, around the job to be done is how do you discover it? Because it's not always the case that you can actually watch someone for multiple weeks on end making a, a purchase um, and see the sort of timeline of the events unfold. And so the way we tend to think about it is that Every job basically has two forces that are pushing and pulling you to make a change in your life, and you have two things that are impeding the change. And so the forces that are pushing you are, are one, the push of the situation. Something about my life could be better right now, right? Where I am isn't, isn't, isn't sustainable, it's not something I can keep doing, or it's, it's something that's actually uncomfortable and I need to change something about it. And then the second thing that's compelling a change is what we call the pull of a new situation. So it's basically I see the solution, I'm like, oh, if I use that, if I, if I enrolled there, I could have a better life or whatever it is, and it's pulling me toward it. At the same time, there's two things impeding change, one of which is just your simple habits of, of, the, of the present situation, that you know, you're on the treadmill and it's easy to keep doing what you're doing right now. And then the other thing is uh, what we say is the anxiety of the new solution. So all the things that make you wonder, gee, with the pixel out, will I be able to use all of its features? What happens if I can't use it? Oh my god, maybe I'm just better off staying with the devil I know, right? And oftentimes when you're designing experiences, people want to put in more and more uh, services and features and so forth. And it turns out often actually taking things away to simplify the solution can reduce that anxiety and cause people to jump in, which we'll, we'll see as relevant on the higher ed question. And so to discover it, we essentially do interviews, not to do uh, focus groups, but to basically recreate, a, in, in essence, a mini documentary of how someone chose to make a switch in their lives around a new product or service, or in this case, to enroll in a higher ed institution. And so you essentially follow this path where almost all uh, customer decisions go through something similar, where they have a first thought that something could be better, that they're going to make a change in their life. 
they go into this sort of passive looking uh, phase and then there tends to be an event of some sort that triggers them into an active looking phase. And then there's typically a, a, a second event that defines the time horizon over which, that they'll make, uh, over which they'll make the decision. So it might be a friend of yours gets in early action for an 18 year old, for example, at a college and you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to make a decision about which college I, I, I need to choose. But there's typically some sort of second event that occurs that actually puts you in this. And then you actually buy and then consume and you can look back and see if it satisfies. And so in essence, in our study, we interviewed hundreds of students, um, 200 plus uh, stories of students making the college choice. And then we followed it up with another 50 or 60 interviews or so uh, to, to go deeper on this, just to basically understand in a variety of contexts across a variety of demographics, um, so uh, races, uh, uh, genders, et cetera, um, what were these jobs to be done that people had? This shows you that it's also, we did a huge spread of learners. So it wasn't simply just the 18 year old uh, leaving high school, going to college. We interviewed students as, uh, as old as 60 about, go, uh, about enrolling. And we were looking at people who had a wide variety of background education. So everything from high school diploma uh, to GED to some college to master's degree, even a PhD or two in there. And then finally our sample set attended all sorts of institutions from simple online programs coding boot camps, part-time and full-time, traditional four-year colleges, grad school, and the like. So it was a pretty wide range that represented um, a lot of higher education. And we were and mirrored a lot of what higher education looks like in the United States today, which really is not the student uh, just going to the grassy green quad and living on a residential campus for four years, but tons of students who live off campus, 70% by the stats, um, in, in our sample, which is roughly equivalent to what you see um, nationwide. Uh, a lot of people working part-time or even full-time jobs, typically attending within state or uh, within 75 miles of where they live uh, and so forth. So a, a pretty comprehensive view of students that look like what higher education looks like across this country at this point. And what we essentially found, and I'll, I'll just summarize it here and, and flip through some of the slides when we get into it, but but there were five core jobs to be done uh, around why students hired college. And so the first one we found is what we call help me, help me get into my best school. So these were students for whom the, the uh, college choosing process in some ways was circular. They were looking to get into their best school for its own sake almost. Uh, they had done the work to be the best and they felt like that they now deserved the best in many cases. And it was all about the act of going in of, excuse me, of getting in, not necessarily what they would do once they got in itself. Um, th to be sure, they would say that they wanted the classic college experience, they wanted the residential experience where they could reinvent themselves with new people. Reputation and prestige were, were certainly important to them. Um, and there was the sense, well, it's the next logical step in my life, right? It's sort of what I'm gonna do next because that's what I'm supposed to do. But they were typically genuinely excited about the experience. To be clear, it didn't have to just happen in college. Um, for better or worse, I realized uh, as I got put through this interview process myself um, that when I went to business school, I clearly fell in this job as well. Um, when you looked at my decision-making process, I thought I was in a very different position, but when you looked at the actual decision I made and how I prioritized it, BEST was very clearly motivating this decision, and we'll talk about it a little bit more uh, in depth in a moment. The second job is sort of the other side of the coin of help me get into my best school. It's uh, what we called help me do what's expected of me. So these are students who are going because someone else in their lives said that they ought to go in essence. And they're doing it to satisfy their expectations, not necessarily because they're super excited. They're doing it to fulfill the wishes of a parent, to fulfill the wishes of a counselor or a teacher who said that they ought to go, to uh, do it because just all their friends are going and well, it's the next logical step in my life, I might as well. Um, they were often doing it uh, with the sense well, of saying, well, it's not exactly what I want to do, but at least I'll check the box and I'll have a safety net to fall back on. Like this can't be a bad decision, um, is often what they uh, would say. We'll talk about how that uh, ended up in some hot water for a lot of these learners, but, but that was essentially the job that we found in the second one. The third one was a group of students who were basically hiring school to help them get away from something really bad in their lives. So they were basically running from something but not necessarily towards something 
and college was something socially acceptable that they could say, hey, I'm signing up for college, and no one would question them. But they really weren't excited about the experience itself. It was all about running from something. So it might have been an abusive stepfather. It might have been a bad hometown that just didn't mesh with who they were. It could have been a bad job. It was all about getting away from where they were right now, though, and not necessarily where they were running to. The fourth uh, job that we uncovered is what we're calling uh, help me step it up. So these are learners who, who in essence, were saying, I actually like um, certain parts of my life, but I'm realizing what I'm doing right now, typically at work, but not always, isn't who I am. This just isn't me. And I need to get some more education and skills so I can step it up in my life. And it was typically triggered because people were relying on them, and they knew that they couldn't disappoint them. And so it might have been that, uh, that they were about to have a child, uh, and they realized that this was going to bring on a lot of expenses, and the current job they were in was no longer uh, 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 you know, fulfilling uh, what they were going to need. They had a new mortgage, maybe, that was hanging over them. It was some sort of event that triggered it. It's now or never. I got to go to school and step it up in my life. And then the last one we found uh, is what we're calling help me extend myself. So these are learners who basically life was pretty good around them. Not great, necessarily, but pretty good. There was very little push, but they were all about, now I have the time and budget, and I've always wanted to challenge myself in this way, or be something more, or learn something else, and now I have the time that I'm going to go pursue this and do it. And so they would typically take what was a low-risk option for their position and go chase this dream. So I'll give you a little bit of color now um, around each of these. But um, we already went through, uh, through a lot of these, but on the help me get into my best school job, these students were overwhelmingly satisfied um, with the choice. You can see it skews that a lot of these students were, quote unquote, your traditional college age student. A um, lot of satisfaction with this choice, which makes a lot of sense. Like they were energized going in. They didn't really know what they wanted once they got there. Um, and in many ways, you could argue the moment they landed there, they were in a new job to be done of trying to figure that out. Uh, but they were thrilled sort of to be where they were in many cases. And, and it had worked out well. Importantly, um, this wasn't just sort of look at the US News and World, uh, World Report rankings, figure out what your top school is, and go that way. It was a little more nuanced than that. It was best for me. And so Ujana was a student we talked to um, who, uh, as you can sing, she was, she was a great pianist, great singer, uh, really wanted to sing gospel um, uh, for a gospel choir when she went to college. And so she framed her set of choices essentially by a set of historically black colleges that were within a certain mile radius of where she lived. Uh, she was in North Texas. And ultimately, she ended up picking the college um, with the most impressive choir, but it was also the one where her sister went uh, to school. And they offered her a full ride. And like the moment that happened, she was all in on this school. She was thrilled by it. What's so interesting is that a lot of these students, they would check off on a box, like I'm going to college to get a job. And she could talk about how uh, they had a good early childhood uh, teacher preparation program. But really, it was all about the choir and how much it felt like family to her. And they sang in lots of different styles. And you could just see the, uh, the dominoes sort of cascade of once she had heard them, spent time with the choir, and so forth. If she got in and she got the full ride, this was clearly where she was going. It was best as she defined the best, if that makes sense. Now, where we saw failure was typically when a student would frame uh, what best was in terms of someone else's demands on them rather than what they wanted. Okay? And I suspect that if we went in deeper in this job, you'd see a lot of subsets and flavors and so forth of this. Um, my sort of narrow one is that there's probably an intrinsic motivation around best, and there's probably an extrinsic um, one. And the intrinsic results in success more often, I would think. But the, uh, but either way, this also obviously is this job is driving a lot of the behavior we saw with the varsity blues scandal and a lot of the uh, headlines that have rocked uh, higher ed admissions over the past year. Is uh, it seems clearly from our perspective motivated in this particular job, and I think a large part of the reason is is like students don't step back and just say let's let's relax. And as parents, we don't give the message to kids that if they attend a school and they work hard and they make a great network, they'll be fine. And they're going to get into school somewhere. The question is, what's the right fit for them, not sort of obsessing over the college. And if you look at the stats across the country, there's basically 
fewer than 50 schools that are extraordinarily selective in who they admit. And out of the other 4,000 schools that exist in this country, there's a great deal of likelihood that you're going to get in many, 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 many places. Um, and many of them will be quite good if you're, if you're fitting it into what you really want and not this conception of uh, following the rankings or something like, like that just blindly and saying like, oh, the top 10 schools in the US News and World Report list are mine because that's what I just think I'm supposed to do out of what best is. But instead, you step back. And in the book, we talked about uh, sort of taking a page from the uh, What Color Is My Parachute book and making a seven petal diagram around what's the right fit for me itself. So thinking about what's the purpose of the school? Does it match something that I'm excited about? What's the, what are the people like, the geography, the size of the school, small, medium, big? Uh, extracurricular activities, are those important or not? Academics, do I know what I want to do and which field I want to be in and therefore it's important? And then the campus life itself. Is it a quote unquote traditional college town or something like that? Is it an urban environment, et cetera? Um, and as you start to make these decisions, frankly, you don't have to know the answer to all these pedals. You just have to identify which ones are really important to you and maybe even more important, which ones are non-starters for you and start to see what you gravitate toward. And, and in the book, we talk a lot about essentially prototyping the experience. You probably can't read this cartoon. But um, the basic idea is that a lot of parents, this is advice to parents of what not to do, um, as you sort of stumble through that. Um, the, uh, the basic idea is that it's very easy to go to a couple college visits and just get excited as the parent about what you think would be right for you but not listen to your kid about what they're actually gravitating toward. In this uh, cartoon, uh, the girl is clearly gravita gravitating toward an urban lifestyle for the, for the campus. And then you'd say, OK, let's pick a few other schools that also have that urban context to it, for example. The flip side, I'd say, is um, you know, maybe you go to a school and you're like, that was awesome. It was both small and in a city. OK, so is it the small thing that you're excited about, or is it the city that you're excited about? Let's visit a large school in a city and start to, start to narrow this down to figure out what is it that's really drawing you to this campus, and then start to find other options and broaden your options alongside of this so that you can go uh, to get into your best school, but something that actually fits how you think about this. Really briefly, uh, one student we talked to for whom uh, this went really poorly, uh, she was a hockey player, uh, honors student, got into her honors college and a scholarship for the hockey team. Felt like a ton of work to her parents. But she was like, no, I, I, I want to be able to say I'm going to this top uh, nationally ranked school and I'm playing for this top nationally ranked hockey team. Being able to say that sentence was really important, not for her own sake, but to be able to tell her friends about it. And so she picked it. And within about a semester, uh, it totally went sideways, where she was just overburdened by both the workload and the, uh, and, and the practice load from the sports. And so she dropped out. So clarifying that is, is, is very important. I'm going to skip the advice for, for schools for right now. Um, the second uh, job, as I said, is that help me do what's expected of me. Perhaps not surprising, but 54% were dissatisfied with their choice. 74% of our sample uh, dropped out or transferred um, from their school. So this was a school, this was a, I, one where I would say, if you're in the help me do what's expected of me, a four-year college with a, that was going to be a high price tag, probably not a great choice. That looking for other options was going to be a, a much better fit to give you some passion and purpose. Um, we saw two distinct personas uh, emerge uh, in this particular job. One was your traditional uh, high school student going to college that you can almost tell the story to yourself. And, and it was, it's interesting, a lot of adults who felt like they went to school to do what someone else expected of them, they've come up to us and readily identified with this one. Um, the other persona that we saw was, uh, an, was a working adult student. And, and right now, in particular, in America, we're, we're focusing a lot on lifelong learning and trying to make sure we figure out how do we upskill and reskill uh, employees with technological change and automation and AI and so forth, changing the nature of work. If that training wasn't aligned to what the student want, or the learner or the employee wanted to do for themselves and a company was paying for it, often you got a lot of people that would just enroll in a post-secondary program, but they had no sense of why they were doing it for themselves. It was all about, well, my employer's paying for it, so I guess they expect me to do this, but I don't actually see the connection. And 
unsurprisingly, you didn't see a lot of completion or mastery of skills and things like that when that was the case. Really aligning that was really important. Um, just one quick story in this one from the book that we tell is uh, about Trisha, <clears throat> who was raised in a religious environment where her pastor essentially chose the school that she was going to. Um, she knew nothing about it. She enrolled literally miserable homesick within the first semester. As the moment things turned south, um, where she uh, at home on the financial front, she was, I'm out. Like, I don't want to be here. My parents need me at home. I'm dropping out. And we saw a lot of that occur um, with students who had this particular motivation. And so the biggest piece of advice, honestly, is you don't legally have to go to school, right? Like, this isn't something you need to do. Instead, um, figure out what are other options. And in the book, we talk a lot about uh, taking a gap year and figuring out ways to actually get work experience to sort of build a sense of passion and purpose um, around what you want to do. Earn money if you can. We, when we say gap year, we don't just mean gallivanting around Europe. Like, actually work some jobs to figure out what do you like and don't like and things of that nature. If you do enroll, however, we sort of saw three pathways out of it. One was uh, to choose a really low risk school um, where you could uh, not pay a lot of money or there, was easy, uh, there were good chances that you could transfer the credits to somewhere else. So one student we talked to, we thought really smartly, um, the anxiety sort of stripped away when she went to a regional college that she knew she could transfer the credits to any other state university in the state. And the moment she realized, oh, the credits will all transfer, she sort of found herself to, uh, back into the help me get into my best school job, able to think through a new set of choices for her, and basically shopping again in the first semester. Um, the second path was actually what Bob, uh, my co-author, did. Um, he, went, he didn't get into Purdue, which is his first choice. Uh, his parents still said, you're going to college. And he went to Michigan State. He wasn't particularly excited about it. Um, was trying to figure out how the heck he could get out uh, and drop out and so forth. Took a part-time job working as an engineer, loved it, and his boss basically said, you want this job full-time? You got to get your degree. You got to step it up and do this. And that gave him the motivation to understand the purpose um, of, of the experience and uh, go hard charging into it. And then the third pathway we saw was essentially you, you arrive at campus and you're immediately in the help me get away job. And so you move away, but moving away without purpose is, is dangerous. And so moving into the help me step it up, basically creating a gap year experience, a series of uh, experiences that you can understand what do I actually really want to do and build my skill set and, and, and pathway around that. I'm going to skip through the parents, but just to say, like, we saw a lot of parents forcing their kids into this job. Try not to be the reason your kid has this uh, experience. Try to figure out an underlying passion or purpose that can get them excited about the experience, and they can make a choice consistent with that. Um, the third job that we talked about that helped me get away, unsurprisingly, again, a lot of dissatisfaction, a lot of incompletion with this one. Um, perhaps that's not surprising, but we had a lot of students like Naomi. They were running from, in her case, an abusive stepdad. Uh, and uh, a mother uh, who was forcing her to take care of two kids who were 13 and 14 years younger than she was. She was just thrilled to get away. Um, the moment she arrived on campus, she took an extra heavy course load in subjects that she didn't actually care about. Um, she said she'd always wanted to be a nurse. She was a business major uh, because they didn't have a nursing program. It was the only school she had applied to. Started to cascade in, in debt. Her grades uh, went down. She had $40,000 in private student loans by the end of the first year. Dropped out, went home, and worked for five years before she went back to school. Um, and you got a lot of these stories when you, when you sort of didn't realize that a really important success criteria is getting away. Like, if you're in this job, you need to get away. But the big question is, how do you get away without incurring a lot of risk, right, in terms of time and money? And so you have to realize you don't know what's next. And so you got to take a step where you're not going to bite off more than you could chew, so to speak. Um, and really prototype your, your future. So go from a, a period where you're, you're, you're thinking about what you want to do, design an experience, scope it out, try it out, and then reflect. What, what do I want more of? What do I want less of? What are the things in the, say, say you worked at a tech company, right? I like coding. I don't like project managing. I like working with other individuals. I don't like being solitary. Start to understand the experiences and the things that you like doing to start to figure out what else might, uh, might follow into that. So you can broaden, again, your options in line with your passions and make a better choice.
The, uh, the fourth job we talked about was this Help Me Step It Up. Maybe not surprisingly, tremendous success in this one as well because people really were motivated um, to move beyond what they were doing and they had some sense of the future as well. Our only real advice here, frankly, was to make sure that you clarified the future. So Ken is an interesting example where he quit his job at a tech company in the Bay Area uh, after seeing his prospects uh, there decline when he was put on a project in a group basically that he knew had no future. Um, he enrolled in a part-time boot camp basically uh, to fill out his portfolio of work so that he would have a set of projects in data science that would allow him to get a, a next job. And he picked the first available boot camp because it was all about convenience. And, and that's, an interesting, that's an important point about this one. This job is, it's not about the brand or, or prestige, it's about the thing that will actually get me the skills or certifications or portfolio the quickest and cheapest possible. Like I want the most direct path into it. Um, and so where we saw failure, frankly, was where people hadn't taken the time up front to really clarify their, 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 their future and really ask themselves, do I really want to do what this is going to put me on a pathway to do? Uh, an example of this was Mindy, uh, who we interviewed. She uh, enrolled in an online university um, to be a teacher, um, even though she had always wanted to be a midwife. Uh, and she did it because she was sort of desperate to prove to herself that she was college material and that she could do it. A lot of her family had been teachers, and so she was like, I guess I could do that. She signed up the moment she got in her practicum experience, so te uh, teaching in, in a school. She was like, oh, I hate this. This isn't for me at all. Dropped out uh, when she realized that the school didn't have any pathways into midwifery that she could transfer. Um, and she was stuck again out sort of on her third uh, at attempt at higher ed. And so the, again, the real thing is here is prototyping, in essence, a variety of possible futures through a variety of uh, immersive experiences, whether that's jobs, internships, volunteer opportunities, and the like, to really start to understand who you are and, and develop some clarity around that. For time's sake, I'm going to skip the cartoons. But the one thing I'll say is, as a parent, you really want to make sure you don't sort of allow your kid to avoid the struggle that's inherent in the help me step it up job. In the sense that it's easy to say like, I know your strengths and weaknesses and therefore this is the right choice for you. It's a much better thing to guide your kid through this process, ask questions to help them navigate, to realize who they are, but don't avoid the struggling moment because they need to innovate in their lives and they need to be invested in it ultimately. And we would see uh, failure occasionally when the parent sort of made it too easy, if you will, to make the choice, and the child wasn't actually bought into this. Last one, um, the Extend Myself, uh, tons of satisfaction in this particular job. I often think about this, frankly, the Help Me Extend Myself job as sort of the massive open online course job. Um, people that are all about extending themselves, challenging themselves, and it's okay if they don't complete because they can go back to doing what they're doing right now. When uh, we uncovered this one, um, Bob, uh, uh, I, I told my co-author Bob, I said, I've never experienced this particular job in my life. And he was like, of course you have, but your version of it is reading a book or hiring a podcast or watching a video on YouTube. It's not dropping everything, taking out another mortgage to go to school. Like you have two young kids and a mortgage, that wouldn't make any sense. So it's appropriate to your stage and phase of life of extending yourself. I think that's an important way to look at it. Um, Navina was someone who worked in a company where she was a marketing, uh, in marketing and communications, realized that uh, she wanted to get much more into data analytics and the like, and so went to a boot camp um, around that. And, and what was so interesting was she realized that she had all the negotiating chips because if it didn't work out, like she was totally happy in her current role. And so she brought a job offer that she had from another company that was going to train her in data analytics to her existing company and said, I'm about to jump ship to try this out. And they're like, no, 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 please don't. We'll pay for you to go to a boot camp and we'll tell you that you can actually start up our data analytics department in this company if it goes well. And if it doesn't, no harm lost. And she basically realized she had all the chips. And so a really important thing I think on this job is A, be very clear about where your boundary is. What's too much risk for you to take on? And once you've clarified that, really expand your options. Fight to realize you have a lot of choices through this. And then realize that it's much more important to choose something over doing nothing. Because at the end of the day, if you choose something that's relatively low risk for you, 
you can always go back to what you, uh, what you were doing, right? And you haven't foreclosed anything, in other words. We saw a lot of uh, learners, particularly, so th this job appeared a lot for uh, uh, moms who had taken a few years off the workforce and were trying to get back into the workforce. We saw a lot of uh, women who were hesitant to get back uh, I into the, um, uh, to, to, to take the plunge, if you will, into higher ed again, because they sort of would say, do I deserve this opportunity? Will I be able to hang? It's been so long, things like that. Giving people permission to go for it and do for it was incredibly important so that they would, uh, so that they would take these, uh, take these uh, jobs on and do it. Just some overall advice um, of three things that I think are, are, are important. One, it, we saw this again and again in the research was that many more students ought to be taking a gap year. Um, and again, it's not a gap year just to travel around for travel's sake, but to really build a sense of who they were passion and purpose, and then to come into a higher ed experience that they had chosen, really fired up to go uh, tackle it. Being able to take pa uh, uh, routes that take you off the beaten path, incredibly important, so that you're not just following the herd because it's what you're supposed to do, but it's in line with your own code and who you are. Um, and then the last one is recognizing that the reason you don't have to run to school right away is because we're going to live long lives at this point. We're in an economy in a day and age where upskilling and reskilling is just going to be part of our learning. We're all going to be lifelong learners, and you're not going to be in any one of these jobs your whole life. You're not a help me get into my best school person, right? Because that's what you are now. You are this at a certain phase, and realizing that you're going to experience most, if not all, of these jobs at some point in your life, and many of them you're going to experience several times, frankly. And education itself might not always be the answer for it. Um, Sometimes career or a job switch or something like that might also give you that learning that you need to make progress. Hopefully that gives you a good sense of the book and sort of um, why we were fired up to write it. It was, it was interesting, and I'll, I'll end on this note and then love your questions. But the, uh, when we started the book, we started it from the perspective of higher ed institutions, actually, wondering if they were trying to serve students who were coming to them with so many different motivations how could they possibly be all things to all people? And was that responsible for a lot of terrible outcomes in higher education right now and a lot of increasing costs because they're managing so much complexity of trying to be all things to all people? And I would say we left the book feeling like that's absolutely the case. And there were so many interesting stories of students trying to navigate this really difficult process that we thought by writing the book, we could give really sound advice to parents and students so they could recognize their why and make better choices. So I'm hopeful that, uh, that this talk gives you an early flavor of that, but more importantly, that you leave uh, the book and, and, and able to navigate your own life, your kids' lives, um, but also to be able to help those around you uh, make these decisions. And I guess my only ask would be if, that if you see someone struggling with this decision and not asking the why question, I'd, I'd love it if you could point them toward this resource to try to help them untangle that. So appreciate it so much, and uh, look forward to answering any questions you have. Thank you. Microphone, I guess, is there, and uh, yeah. Um, hello, thank you for the um, um, very interesting talk. I was curious if you had a perspective on credentialing. Yeah. Uh, since that is kind of partly the reason most of us, you know, need to <laughs> yeah, go totally. for higher education. Yeah, totally. So credentialing is in two forms also right now, right? Because there's also the rise of badges and micro-credentials and all this new set of things that I would say is confusing the heck out of this uh, higher ed world right now. Um, credentialing was a huge part of it. Frankly, a lot of people in the help me step it up job uh, or the help me get into my best school, it was all about the degree and sort of what it signaled, not necessarily about the journey there, right? And so if you could imprint on someone the degree, they already had the skill set, they were delighted with that option. Um, and it would drive a lot of it. I, I think a very clear takeaway is companies like Google that have stopped requiring degrees for, for jobs and actually started to look at the actual skills and knowledge that you need to be successful in, that, in those jobs would be a tremendous step forward, frankly, to take a lot of the pressure that has built up on, the, on, on this college choice. I mean, it's, it's interesting, like in the help me do what's expected of me job, right? I've decided, like, I'm not excited about college. My parents are pushing me. Why are they pushing me? Because they think it's the key to get a good job. Why do they think that? Well, because employers are uh, 
there's been tremendous degree inflation in the last uh, three decades, where jobs that 30 years ago that did not require degrees and people working in them today don't have degrees now require degrees because they can't figure out what are the actual skills at the heart of them. And it's created a huge problem uh, of, of over-credential, like you said, for, for, uh, for various things. At the same time, we're seeing all these micro-credentials emerge that I think it's unclear how that's going to play out. Is it going to add to this race? Um, or will it allow us to get more precise about the signals? Um, and I think that's going to depend a little bit on the analytics and assessments and so forth that we apply to this. And, and do we insist that these are mastery-based degrees, like you've actually mastered something? Or are we going to continue under the facade we have of it's about the brand where you went to school and the fact that you got in, not necessarily what you learned during the experience? And that, I think that'll be a key question to watch to see how this plays out. It's a really good question. Others? All right, go for it. First, first of all, that was fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. And there's nothing wrong with a milkshake in the morning. Right? So, um, Amen. <laughs> when you were doing the research, did you also find a group of students that, um, and I guess it was in the, the slide that you had where their, their progression towards getting to the point where they were jacked up about going to school. Yeah. Did you find a group of students that for a while there were almost pushing back on the whole idea because they didn't want to get to that next step. They feared the next step. For sure. I, I saw that in my son and both of my nephews, all three who then got into terrific schools. Yeah. But for a while, at the end of their high school, they would have rather climbed Everest in, je you know, in shorts and t-shirts than actually gone to a college to look at the school. The anxiety, that, so yes, absolutely. And you'd see the anxiety build up in the stories, right, um, of, of misgivings about will I make it, misgivings about the process, the, the, the competition and, 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 and frankly fanaticism around it. I mean, uh, the over-focus in certain communities on this decision contributes from a social perspective to the job to be done that creates a really overheated context that I think pushes actually a lot of people in the help me do it's expected of me job. Um, be, exactly right? the one. Yeah, exactly. Because, because like, oh my god, I don't know. Like, I, you're just telling me, and I might have had a reason, but now I'm push, being pushed toward this thing. And I think we, we saw that several times. What's so interesting is that uh, the, 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 the learners themselves, they don't always have the language around that or the ability to sort of step out of it because the social pressure is so intense. The, the flip side, a lot of people have asked, well, what about low-income communities that maybe don't have access to college historically, where the social pressure is maybe very different, right? Um, and what's interesting there is uh, that that is true on the one hand, but we also saw a lot of like no excuses charter schools and students going there, where from day one, even though their parents weren't talking about college per se, the teachers and the, and the counselors were. And on the one hand, that's a really good thing because it could, you know, going to college and graduating can lift your entire family tree out of poverty, literally. And on the other hand, if you were going because you didn't have the motivation, like you didn't know why, you didn't develop a bigger sense of purpose be besides, well, my teacher for five years has been telling me this is what I'm supposed to do next, then the outcomes there tended to be pretty bad. And I think that's one of the reasons, like, people don't realize that the six year graduation rate from four year colleges in this country is roughly 60%. So six-year graduation for four-year colleges. If you're going to a two-year college, the uh, three or four-year graduation rate is effectively 28%. Oh. So we're sending a ton of people where they lack that intrinsic motivation. And it's not going to end well, is the point, right? And so I think rethinking these pressures and questions around it is really important for employers and parents, frankly, in a lot of these communities, but also the educators themselves, not necessarily to say you shouldn't go to college, but before you go, we're going to actually help make sure that you've built up an intrinsic purpose and passion so you can make a choice you're excited about, not we're excited about for you, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's a great question. Hitting about time, I guess, but yeah. anything else? Thanks so much. Hopefully this is helpful, and I uh, appreciate it. Thank you.